NASDAQ continues to struggle with 500. What's it going to take to get us over the line? Election is this week. What it means for the stock market, bonds, and inflation. Equity concentration is at 100-year highs not seen since 1932. Why this can continue. 20-year Treasury sells off on non-farm payrolls ahead of FOMC meeting next week. What the odds are saying. With the majority of hyperscalers with their earnings out, we're going to talk about who's winning the race and who's losing. Several names have earnings this week admits FOMC and the election. SMCI is slated for Tuesday. We're going to talk about what you need to watch for. Amazon's record earnings and Bezos selling $3 billion the same day. What you need to watch. And should you really care? Smart money, dumb money is dropping at the fastest rate. We're going to talk about why and what you can do about it. AMD punishes investors with earnings plummeting. The stock's down on the week 15% why this is only affecting AMD and why NVIDIA was up $5 after hours on Friday. Absolute best thing about the end of the month is we get monthly charts. And I want to take a second here before we get into the nitty gritty and talk about what's actually going on out there on a monthly basis. So if we could just look here at NASDAQ futures, and I'm going to put in very simple moving averages. And what we're looking for is any kind of trend or any kind of excessive move. Now, this is only going to go back so far. For our purposes, what we're going to do is just take 10 years. And we are going to get into a lot more detail here about what's going on for the week ahead. But I do think it's important to just put things in check. So we have a 55, a 22, and a 12 monthly average. And what I do is I always look at the percentages from peaks off of that level so that I can get a better understanding of what's going on. Now, it doesn't always mean that something's going to happen when this does, but you want to just be cognizant of the last time that it happened. So if we look at the NASDAQ futures, and you can see right up here, you're at that 79.76 level, which was the last time we had any correction. And you look at where we are right now, and you can see that that's 39. Now, does that mean that you can't come back down and have a correction? No, but these are monthly numbers, and they give us a really good, solid sense of where support and resistance truly are, and also, are we overextended or aren't we? Now for me, when we start rising a little too high on the 12, I think that's more appropriate because you should be around that 12 year or that 22 month moving average to some extent. And if you just take the peaks again from where you're at and look for the greatest differential. Now the, by greatest differential, you can see 40% here on the 22. And what you're doing is just seeing is there anything that's closely in common and then you're about half of where you are there. And then of course, with the 55 and the 12, you can see not even close. You're just riding that line straight up. When you get over overextended or too far off of one of these, that's when you could really run into a problem. Another way of doing this is just look at standard deviations. And standard deviations are Bollinger Bands. And all we're looking for are anomalies or places of interest. For example, you want to see the width of the band because that tells you a lot about what's going on. So when we look at the bands, we can see how tight they are, and now we can see how wide they've gotten, which means that you are setting yourself up for even what? more wild swings that people are going to think is going to be out of the ordinary. But really what it's telling us is to expect more volatility going forward in the months ahead. And it's important to always look at the time frame when we're saying this stuff. And there's a couple of reasons for this and we'll get to it. But as you see this rally and you get to what we refer to as the second standard deviation, and this is really important. If you think of this line as the median of where everything is good, it's very, very simple. Whenever you see this, dependent upon your time frame, if you are below this, it's bearish. If you are above this, it's bullish. That's why you'll see a lot of people that are long-term investors or that use the bands. When it breaks the band, they just stay out of the way. And when it gets above the band, they get back involved. Breaks the band, they stay out of the way. You want the close and gets back above the band, they get in. And you could see that even here on April 22nd, it would have kept you out of the NASDAQ futures market. And then when it flipped back over here in May 23rd, you would have just hopped back in and just used this as a deviation line and closing below it to be back out of the market. It's not rocket science, very simple. And you can always look at this and see our favorite patterns where you have that up, down, one, two, three, up. We call those rising threes and they're the most predictable patterns in the market. Great book on that is by Bolkowski, Encyclopedia of Candlesticks. So what is this really telling us? Well, if this is the average, then one standard deviation over that is really where you're going to see 67% of all moves. And that's why when you get to the second, it's 95%. And that's always when you're out of that 95%, People get a little, I won't say jittery, but out of a monthly chart on 95%, it's a big deal. 99.7, 
uh, would be huge. And if you just go back through time, you're not really going to see many of those. It's going to be an event just like you had down here. And for our purposes, I can blow this up very quickly, but for our purposes, that was the great financial crisis. And you can see how you came out of that third standard deviation. And when you're riding that line, you really have to think that, okay, we're getting to that point where it's gone too far. It's just gone too far. Even when you start hitting it up here, you're on the other side of it. You have to start asking yourself questions. And again, this is monthly, so we're looking at a much longer term time frame. It's just not achievable for it to be that way. Now, the volatility of the market, in my opinion, is based upon the level of concentration, and we'll get that to a second. But I think it's a very important concept to get and say, okay, where are we? Are we really that over, quote, bought here on a percentage basis off major moving averages? And, no, and the answer is no. What we will note is that when we pop out here on the monthly chart, we do want to pay attention to that because that is an area where we see, you know, they're kind of playing whack-a-mole a little bit with us right there, aren't they, as they did here on February 20th. And then, of course, you just hit the line here during the pandemic. Funny what the pandemic looks like on a chart, isn't it? So when you see this and you see the ride, the ride up is not the problem. It's over. That would give us that chance to say, okay, this is too much. And then we could come back into one of these other levels. I don't see anything here statistically speaking, that has us too high. If we take a look at the S&P, we can see these levels and we can see how it just played out here on that third standard deviation line. And look what happens when we're cracking that second standard deviation line on the monthly. Every time we've poked our head over, right, we've had to wait for this to rally. And I wanna be really clear about this. They get wider, right? As they go up, the same level no longer is second standard deviation. It becomes between one and two. And people will say, well, then why does this matter? And I'll show you the cleanest way to look why you wanna look at bands. If I drop a line right here and we can see the pattern of up, one, two, three, down, rides the rides the line right here, right third rail, boom, hits it, and then you just pop on that day. We all remember what this was, and this boils down to everything that we preach. This stool has gotten more positive comments than me, so we're gonna bring it back. And I just wanna say that this is definitely the stool that has won. I don't know why everybody loves this stool so much, but this is the clear winner and we'll be using it. So this is everything that we preach when we talk about the stool and how we trade, where we have the macro leg, the fundamental leg, and we have the technical leg, and then here we are. Sometimes we lean on the front of the stool or the back, depending if we're leaning towards the front of the bar or the back of the bar or sideways. Now, this determines the macro world around us, which is what is going on. The fundamentals will be affected by what macro has happens and technical tells us technical tells us when to get involved now that bar right here that's marked that just happened to bounce off of here and encapsulate these three other bars which makes this absolutely perfect play was exactly when Powell came out and said, we're not going to raise rates anymore. And since then, you can see the move. That's why this is so significant. But what we really want to focus on here, and we'll get rid of the stool so you're not blinded by its beauty, and what we'll do is we'll just get rid of all the data except for the Bollinger Bands for a second, and you're going to note something. Once he stated this, what happened to the bands? They started to expand. And this is really important because you can see the expansion and contraction of the band. So for example, if we go here and say, well, right here, we can see the contraction of the bands. And then you can see the expansion from there. So this is a very important concept. And I just want to walk you through the concept of it. If we start seeing how they're expanding here and then how they take off, expansion of bands doesn't always mean that you're going up. But when you start to see this kind of expansion, you want to pay attention to it. Now, if you overlay this with it, what happened when the bands expanded? We went higher, okay? What happens when the bands consolidated? We stayed in a consolidation pattern. Essentially, you didn't really go anywhere, did you? What happened when the bands expanded? Okay, we started going higher. So it's really important, especially on a monthly time frame, to see this. Also, you want to make sure that your bands from where you're at or always above where the other band was if you're looking at something like this over a long period of time. Now, is there not reason to be concerned? I think there's some things here that should have us very concerned. Uh, and we're gonna go through some of those. But I think if you look overall with the expansion, this is what we wanna monitor and we wanna monitor this on a monthly basis. And the beauty of this now is we're able to do that because we have end of the month charts and we're going into the last two months of the year, which are usually fairly positive. 
Now, time frames are everything, and this is what's important about bands. And what I'm trying to do here is and just introduce you to the concept of how you should look at this. If you are below this band, and you can ask uh, if, if people in the community will know this, they'll be they'll, they'll know point blank and be like, "Geez, why was he so negative on Friday?" And I was when I was live trading. <laughs> I was shorting a lot of big tech uh, for the day, and there's a reason for this. Once you start breaking these levels, to have a positive bias on the market is not conducive to staying as a trader. What it will lead to is you being in your basement eating Hot Pockets. And nobody wants to be in their mother's basement eating Hot Pockets. So what does this mean? You just told me that the monthly chart looks great. It does, but that doesn't mean that you should be trading next week on the monthly chart. See, we keep hearing that no matter who wins, uh, the, on the election and obviously FOMC next week, we keep hearing no matter who wins and what happens, we're, we're going to wind up going higher because of the relief. That's historical data and it doesn't mean that it's definitely going to happen. We don't know how much of that is baked in. Now, by looking at the ES, you would have to say not a lot because you really haven't gone anywhere. So what am I showing you here and what's important? There's a couple of key things that you should be looking at here and you should be looking at the back data and seeing if what I said earlier actually is true. Is what he said actually true? So let's go take a look at January for a second and see if my thesis holds weight. And the purpose of this is to give you something actionable that you can use next week to make more informed decisions. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't buy names when they are down and you don't trade them, but you understand that am I, and this is how I always look at the market, is there, am I underwater if this is a water line? And then if I'm underwater, is there a beach ball pushing me up to get to that line? Or is there a weight on me, right? And that weight's keeping me down and pushing me under the water. Does it mean that I'm not gonna be able to push against that weight to get back up over the water? And it doesn't mean that that beach ball is gonna just not get tighter up here, but it does put me in a position of power to understand, am I fighting the trend or not fighting the trend? Right now, if you are going long, you are fighting the trend. Very simply, you're fighting this particular trend, and we're gonna to get to that in a second, because it doesn't mean that you don't do it, but you just need to be cognizant of where you're at. See, understanding where you are is really just the battle. Not telling the market what it's going to do but just understanding that this is what's happening. So when we look at stuff like this and we go, oh, well, we're underwater. Well, that would mean that I would do much shorter term trades right now than longer term trades, right? Because I don't know how long or how bad this gets. For example, if I'm stating that you want to buy when you are above that level and you bought here, when you popped back over, you did okay. If you got out of the market here, let's clean this all off. I'm not gonna have time to edit this. If you sold when you broke here and didn't get back involved to your over that level, well, that's pretty simple, isn't it? And then here, again, I got back in. Well, I got out and then I got back in. And again, I'm just playing devil's advocate with you so you can see the utilization of this. Oh, I'm out, I'm back in, and over and over and over go goes, right? So you can see this, and now this is why I would have a short-term negative bias on the market. Well, does that mean that you don't buy? No, what it means to me is I look for extreme moves now. So the extreme moves are where I would be interested in buying, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So you see something like this where you pop out of that third band? See how tight this is getting in here? See how tight it's been getting since October, right? Versus how wild it was and the wild swings we were having. This is telling you, right, that you need to be really careful right now. And I think that there's a lot pointing to the reasons that you need to be careful. So if we take this and overlay it, you'll see the same exact thing. And if you look at Friday, the move was to wait for the rally and then just short the names. And you could see that very clearly here. So this is a great demarcation line. Remember, you have, a, you have a lot going on this week and we have these levels. To me, that they don't look like they're going to pass. And the concentration is insane. Now, I am not one that's going to act based upon concentration because it's silly, because you don't know when it's gonna act. But just because they're fattening us up every single day and we're a turkey doesn't mean that Thanksgiving isn't going to happen and we're not gonna get hit with a hatchet, right? So we have to understand that the equity market concentration is the highest in 100 years. 1932, things didn't go too well. 2023 is where we're at 100 years later. And the issue with this for me is that this is the largest stock relative to the 75 percentile that we've ever had. So there are certain names that are working and the rest are not. And this is really important. And I, I'm not sure that we should be saying, oh, it's definitely gonna stop because we're here because we talked about it here and said, oh, it's definitely gonna stop because we're there. Okay, and this is something that we really want to pay attention to. Even 09, is it something you really had to pay attention to? Not really. 
but the rest of the market needs to start participating. And I don't think we're gonna get that for a couple weeks here at best. Now, historically speaking, and I'm gonna share more of these charts. People, when I brought up fundamental analysis last week, a lot of people were saying, well, we don't have access to the same stuff, same research, I get that. So you're gonna start seeing me work some of the uh, fundamental stuff in these videos that I think would be helpful for people to know. Specifically today, I'm gonna to go through some of the data center data because I think it's fascinating. Uh, you are here, I'm gonna draw an arrow on their arrow and you can see the red line right here very clearly. And you can see that they're saying historically, this is where we're at over the past 100 years. But this is blended and I wanna be really clear. What they're really saying is you're at 102 and historically over the next you know, t time period, you get to 106. Okay, so if you think about it as from a stock perspective, you're in, let's say stock ABC at 102 and it goes to 106. Do you feel the need that you have to get in that stock? Not really, but what you wanna understand about this is if you look historically over this period of time, this is where it changes. And if you overlay this with any kind of presidential election, this is where it goes. But there's some other things out there on the front that we really need to talk about. On Friday, we had non-farm payrolls come out and it was considered a non-event or was it? It actually wasn't and we'll explain why. But non-farm payrolls came out at 12 and we were looking for consensus of 13, 113 and the previous was 22.3. Now, why was non-farm payrolls down so much? You had two hurricanes and you have a Boeing strike. Okay? And what they did here, very conveniently again, is they put us in a position here a very weird position where they just didn't allow the number to come out the way it should have. So what the government did was inflate government jobs again. And what happens here, and I should just rewind this for people who have not watched one of these videos before. See these three non-farm payrolls, which is the private sector right here, private manufacturing jobs, think Boeing, government jobs, think government. Those three make this up. So when you come here and you see these numbers, right, you always look at these because these are your three big players to get to this number. Now, when you look at this, we can see manufacturing off a cliff, two hurricanes off a cliff. We're supposed to be 90, we're at negative 27. So what people are viewing here is saying, wow, this is you know a really bad number. It got blown off. Well, did it? Did it get blown off? Because I think that we're seeing this massive bifurcation between what reality is and what's happening. CME Fed tool, which is the Fed watch, which tells the percentage of what we expect to have happen. Take a look right here. We didn't even move on that number. We didn't go to a 50 basis point. We didn't increase the 50 basis points for next week. December didn't move either. And for time's sake, I'm not going to show it. But what I want you to get is there is, based upon where we're at right now, which is the 475, 500 level. And you can see right here that that's where we're at. And then they just make it very simple. What are the chances of they don't do anything? 1.1%, where are we here? 98 or 0.9, okay, and then they break it down here. But what they're telling you is, you have a 98% chance that they cut rates by 25 basis points, and you have a 1% chance they do nothing. Well, that's pretty interesting. Now, people say don't chart yield. I chart everything. If it moves, I chart it. So if I look at this, what happened on Friday? Well, yields went higher. And what it means when yields go higher, it means bond prices go lower. So if yields go higher, that means they are selling bonds. So they are selling bonds, and that's why yields go higher. Right. An easier way for us to look at this is just to look at TLT. And if you're in the community or you've been watching some of these videos, you know that the simplest way to, to affect a change with this, and if you learn one more thing from this video, it'll be this trade. So just off the open, you know, and we've seen Druckenmiller and these guys shorting this. Now, if they're going to cut rates this week, why are they selling the long end of the bond? Right. Take a look at TMF. This is the simplest short in the world. Whenever you see something like this and they're selling bonds, all you have to do is just this 3X bond. It's the long end. Think of it as the dragon's tail. Whenever you see something like this, you just it's, such the, it's just such an easy short watch because all they're gonna do is just sell it all day long. I'll get rid of my moving averages. And you can just see right off the open, rallies, breaks, and that's it. And then all day, all they did was sell the long end. So why are you selling the long end of the market if they're going to cut rates? You wouldn't. Right, so somebody's going to get hurt this week. Somebody in the bond market's going to get very, very hurt. They're good because if they cut, bonds are going to rally. Bonds are going to rally really hard because they're telling us right now that they do not think that bonds are going to rally, which also fits into what people are saying about the election that if Kamala wins, you want to buy bonds. 
if Trump wins, you want to sell bonds. Now, how, why? Because Trump, more inflation, Harris, less inflation. Whether that's true or not, I don't even really want to get into for so many reasons. But that's the street and that's what they're thinking. But on that move, look how we sold down. I think this is really important to get because what we also are seeing is this, not only the positioning of smart money, dumb money, but why the heck are they selling gold? So gold's been rallying and it's not just retail that's buying it. If you look at what's been happening into gold prices versus the real yield out there since 22. Since they froze Russian, central banks are buying, and I wanna be clear about this, it's not just Russia that's doing it. Once this happened, every central bank out there has gone out there and said, we don't want that to happen to us. You've seen gold go from 2000 to it probably goes significantly over three. No country is ever gonna to wanna to be placed at the whim of the US. So they are going to buy gold, and that's why you're seeing this rally. But it's a very interesting time to watch gold come down and then sell bonds at the same time. It almost feels like they're going flat into next week because there's just too much risk. And we're seeing this also with retail and we're seeing this with what institutions are doing. Let's take a look at smart dumb, and dumb money and see what we can get from that. In front of us is smart money, dumb money. And for those that don't know, we do not refer to it as that. We refer to smart as institutional because of the way it's calculated. And we refer to dumb as retail because of the way that that is calculated. So when you see smart money, I want you to think institutional. And when you see dumb money, I want you to think retail. And we're starting to see a pattern. And this is a pattern that usually leads to some kind of either stagnation in the market where we start going sideways or we start to form some kind of top. So I do wanna talk about it because I do think it's pertinent. And for us, when things change, we wanna pay attention to it. So what we're seeing right now is we're seeing in red, which is dumb money, but we refer to that again as retail. We were overbought and we don't care when we're overbought. What we care about is when we break the level of overbought and the speed in which it drops, then we wanna make sure that institutions or smart money is catching up. And what we'll note here is that they are not. So for example, when we break, like we do here, and then you start to see the drop, is institution stepping up fast enough to eat what retail is puking? Sometimes the answer is yes, they are. The other time the answer is no, they're not. Now by the look of this, when we were gonna dive in this a little cl closer, we're not seeing that at all. And so when we see these turns, like we saw it here in J January, but look how fast institutions got involved. We're not seeing that at all. We're not making higher highs, we're making lower lows. And we're seeing this turn when we start looking at the spread, but take a look at this a little closer. Now here we are and we're just looking at the year. And from my perspective, it's always good to just kind of zoom in. We're, I'm going to look at year to date here with you in a second as well. But all right, we have the crosses and they're of interest because these crosses, when we're selling at this level right here and we crack, which is this is that overbought level. Remember, I don't care that I'm overbought. I care when I go from overbought to more of a neutral stance. It's the change that's the problem. Take a look from here, for example. What was the issue? Where was the top? The top was the chain. That was the pullback. It had nothing to do with us staying over inflated. So you don't really just wanna act because of one thing, you wanna act because of two things. My problem, or my, I shouldn't say problem, but my concern now is what we normally see is we normally see some buying as we puke retail. We're not seeing that yet. Now, maybe we do see that after the election next week, and maybe we're just seeing that hands-off approach, but retail is running for the exits right now, according to this, and dropping precipitously and what are we doing? We're not seeing that institutional level come in. So not only is it important that we're cutting through this on the overbought side, and that is the concern, but we're not being caught. We're not being caught at all. As a matter of fact, we're starting to see more selling at the end of the day, but we'll get to that in a, in a moment why it's so important. Now, one of the things we do like to see is when we look at year to date, is we want to see if we're being caught. Are retail stepping up? They're making higher highs as we're selling. Retail selling, right? So retail selling, institutions are getting involved. And that's what we wanna say. We wanna make sure that that's what's going on because if that's not the case, well, then it becomes an issue for us because we're not gonna have a bid in the market, meaning we're gonna have nobody to sell to when retail pukes. So like if retail just gets out of the way, that in and of itself is fine if you see this, which is what we're saying, right? We're seeing that need to come in there. But if we don't see that need, that's where the problem comes in. Now, if you have that need, but you're already overbought on the institutional side, hence smart money, then look what happens. You still come down because their plate is full. So what you want is you want them oversold 
and then after they're down at that oversold level, which is right here, then what we wanna say is we wanna see a situation where they can do what? Come and, and get in there and start taking up some of that like they did over here and now they were unable to. Now, we are in a position here where we were hitting these higher highs over and over again and they were hitting what? Lower lows and they still are. What we need to say is them to start eating up the supply that retail is puking. That in and of itself becomes the problem and this is pretty explanatory when we go through some of these little minute changes that we're seeing in the market. But look at this in graph form. And what we're looking for is just what, what is this telling us? Is it telling us anything of consequence? Is it telling us anything that we want to know? I think that it does. I think it tells us a lot. And what we want to see are these peaks and then how we act at the peak when we're over the green line. The peak and then how we act from there. And you can see that sometimes that does form a bottom. Sometimes it's not going to. Remember, you were fighting the Fed here. And then this is where the Fed puked. Uh, and this is when the bottom of the market. So you want to look at those events as well. But I personally think that the easiest way to look at this on any level is to review it from this stamp. To mark off when you undercut and then get back over of this line. Now you'll note, you didn't really undercut here and you really didn't undercut. I do wanna mark them off just so you can see what I'm talking about. So if we just drop a line there and then if we say, okay, you kind of undercut here, but not really, you really didn't, you got to it, but we're gonna call it close enough. Versus, and what you're looking for is the time that you come through that line. Not when you're down here, but what happens when you come through that line? And you can see that you'll start marking some kind of top. Now this reversed and you went sideways, but when you start to look at this, it gets pretty obvious what's happening here. Again, you can see it right here as well. All of these are not levels where you wind up going higher. Now you might've gone stagnant here when this started to roll, but it's not the bumps that get us. It's when we're flipping that becomes so imp important because it's that flip through that level where we start to see it. And are they all gonna be perfect? No, they're not. This one's not perfect at all. We just went sideways for about probably a couple weeks. And this one, if we take a look at it, mark that high, and then you rolled with it. And that's, it is what it is. And then that puts us right here right now. So is this a be all, end all? Is it something you have to put, pay attention to? It's not a be all, end all. You need to pay attention to it. Because to me, it's telling us that, yeah, maybe we are getting toppy. You know, you have a lot of uncertainty next week with the election, and you have a lot of uncertainty with the FOMC. And it could just be that people are just saying, you know what, let me get out of the way, because you have a whole variable set of things that could happen. And you could have the Republicans come into office through a sweep. That's one thing that could happen. You could have uh, the pres a president come in on the Republican side, and then what happened? You have a stalemated Congress, right? And then after you have those variables, you could have the Democrats stay in power, and they could have not a sweep at this point by, the, by how it looks, but they could have a locked Congress, okay? So there's three different variables that are on the table right now. And then on top of that, you have two other variables with the FOMC. Do they cut 25 basis points or do they leave rates unchanged? So when a trader or institution's looking at this right now, they're going, well, is this gonna happen? Is this and this happening? Or is this and this happening? Or this, okay? We don't know, or this. They don't know. So when they start going through all these variables, right? They, and they start realizing that there's so many, they might just be sitting on the sidelines and saying, hey, we just really wanna see how this plays out. And that could be the case. It also could be the case that they have it set in their head what's going to happen, which we have seen some of that, and they're just staying out of the way. Because you have been seeing them position themselves a little differently here. Let me show you this. Now in front of you is a graph called the last hour. This is a graph I like a lot and I've shown it a couple times, but patterns are really everything to me. I'm always looking for patterns and I'm always looking for, hey, is this something I need to pay attention to? So what you're gonna see are areas in here where we hit levels and then stop. So I'm not so interested in what the number is, I'm more interested in the relative performance around the number for a given period of time. So for example, if you take a look at this little area, what do we see there? Well, we have that little area, and what does that little area really tell us? At that 550 number coming straight across right here, it's not really telling me anything, but what is telling me something is that I've hit here on the last hour. I'll show you how the last hour is calculated in a second, but look what starts to happen here. You start to see those double tops again. You can even see it down here. So it's not really a function 
of where it is. And you can see the doubles here as well. And now what do we have again? Well, we're starting to get those doubles. So if we were to take a line, for example, and just go like this and just mark these levels off, well, do we see anything there that is something that we could use? And is it always gonna work? No, because you know why? Not everything always works, right? But what you can see is that when it rolls from there, you start running into an issue when you get out of that little box, except for here, right? But you can see it right there as well. And what do you have here? It's happening again. And so does this mean that we have to get out? No, it means that you need to pay attention. You need to really pay attention to this area because on the last hour, we're starting to lose the institution. And I'm gonna explain what that means, but really just understand that institutions are doing somewhere between 25% of their business in the last half hour. So when you have that last half hour and all of a sudden you're seeing this kind of behavior where they're selling in that last half hour versus a different kind of behavior where they're buying and have been buying in that last half hour, that is changing this graph. I wanna show you this is calculated, but this is important because you can watch the last half hour of trading and saying, okay, are we going higher or lower? And there is no day where this is more important than Friday. There is just no day. You can actually wait the days as the week goes on. But to me, there's no date more important than Friday, and I'll explain why. But before we go further, let's just understand what we're looking at, because to me, it's everything. The last hour is an indicator cumulative AD line for the last hour of trading on the SPY ETF. So it's looking at the SPY ETF, and then it's saying, if the last hour of trading from 3, 8, 3 p.m. to 4 is of Eastern Standard Time is up, you get a one, okay? So if you're up, you get one, and you add it to the count. If the value is down, you subtract a one. All right, simple enough, plus one, okay? Plus one, and then you would just go minus one, right? And then, oh, you're up again, plus one, and then eventually you would just get cumulative every hour, last hour that the trading is up. And if the hourly trading goes down, then you're just gonna get something like this. It's not a big deal, right? But it does let you know, okay, well, they're selling the last hour. Now, I tend to wait Fridays, and the reason that I wait them when I wanna watch is because if you're an institution, for example- Order canceled. And what you'll see if, the, if you're an institution is let's say you have a million shares of Apple to sell. And then you look at your chart and you realize that it's Thursday and you've only sold, you know, let's just say that this is the, the full amount that you're supposed to sell and you've only sold this amount. Well, your broker needs to sell all of this coming straight across before when? before the end of the day, they gotta get out. And that's how pension funds work or even large institutions. If they wanna be out of something, they give the broker or their whoever they're using, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and they say, hey, you, you have a million to sell, you have all week. And then if something hits, they, you know, they, they try to do their best. But Friday, they get to the point where it's like, okay, I said, get me out, and they have to get out. All right, and that's why Friday's so significant. But what you're looking for here is the trend model applies a moving average, advanced decline line, looks for instances where the count deviates above or below the moving average, users define a signal as a trend change. I'm not looking at that. And you can look at something like that, but I don't really care for their moving average. That's why it's so important to understand what the data is, because then you can figure out what you want to do with the data. So if we take a look here and we just use the past year, and you'll see a couple of them, like you'll see it right here again, and I just think it's important just to highlight it. I don't tend to look at longer time frames. I'm more looking at these little shorter time frames, right? I'm not looking for these longer, like, oh, this is something like that, and I'm not looking for divergences. What I'm looking for is, what are you doing? And when you start to see this kind of stuff, it does become, to me, it becomes a little obvious, right? That what you're saying is, okay, we're starting to roll. Now, people will say, well, it didn't happen here. Yeah, it's not gonna happen all the time, but it did start a little bit later and then not pick up again until then. And it can do that. It can. We don't want to see the last hour start to pick up. We do not want to see this get worse. We don't want to see it roll, and we don't want to get see it get weaker and weaker, because if it's getting weaker and weaker, and you start getting something like this, where you start dropping, even if this starts going up, which would be the worst case scenario for the index, it's going to be a major problem. I think some positionings differ, where gold, silver, and now we're starting to get into this uranium trade and data centers. And this is really one of the major themes that's going out there. And we're seeing a lot of the players out there try to figure out which way we're supposed to go. But I think this is really important for us to pay attention to, that is uranium going to play the same way as gold and silver? And I think the answer to that is a very strong maybe. I don't think it's a yes, because when you look at it, you're looking for the standard, which is gold. But I think commodities in general are areas of interest. For example, we're seeing this trend, and we've broken down here, 
But as these data centers are created and they start looking for more power, we're certainly seeing uranium trade. And I do think that you should look at this and consider like, hey, this might actually continue to push. If I just use the global uranium ETF, I mean, there's several different ones we could use, but we're just gonna use that. And we come across here and just look at this for a second and the amount of times that you've come to the top of this control bar and then you failed. And what I would suggest that you have with uranium here is a range and a range that you really just can't get through. So what we always like to see is the breakout and then the follow through weekly bar breakout and follow through weekly bar, breakout and follow through weekly bar. What are we not getting? Where's my follow through bar? So what you would wanna do is make sure that you have the follow through weekly bar. Most people are going to look at this trade and say, oh, I broke the higher high, I'm definitely getting in. No, you need the close. Not saying you can't trade it, but for it to be where you need it to be, that's what you need. Now, what you might be getting here is you might be getting a really interesting cup and handle on this. And I do think it's working. I do think it's worth mentioning. And it's not a perfect cup. You can see it down here uh, and you can see how it's lifting. You know, it's very simple. It makes me kind of laugh. We just went through those dragon patterns. And if you really look at this, this should be a little shorter and this should be a little more humpier. But if you think about the dragon head right here, first paw, hump, second paw, and then lifts and goes, you can start seeing these dragon patterns everywhere. So uh, that video was two weeks ago, if you want to go take a look at it. I'm going to actually clip that and make a special video out of that for you guys so that you can just go look at that dragon pattern video over and over again but when you start to see them <laughs> you can't you can't unsay it it's like taking the red pill in the matrix but so what do we really have going on here with uranium well if I clean off my thousand levels and I just drop to the breakout bar so you just want to watch here overlay the simplest of moving averages and we're below the 22 do I want to get involved there probably not and then again you could also do that with Bollinger Bands and just say all right do I want to be in this am I up or over this and you'll find that that the 20 EMA lines up pretty close to a 22 SMA. So it's a real quick way to actually be looking at the bands without having them on your screen. Just watch the 22 SMA. It's one of the reasons why I use it. Now we're asking ourselves, well, if data centers and uranium so important, what happened to AMD? And I know for a fact that everyone's looking at this and thought it was going to push. And I'll be really clear. All they had to do was come out with decent guidance. And that's not what they did at all. Their guidance was an absolute dumpster fire. And there's really no other way to say it. And this is why you finally are starting to roll. We've been giving them a pass for a very long period of time. If you've been watching these videos for months, we actually talked about this area and putting the short on. Uh, I didn't, and just to be candid, I did not. I was too busy doing other things, probably falling in love with NVIDIA again. But if you can see this, right, we really are not going anywhere. You're actually just trending down as people start to realize that, you know, as this is just not the one, and I know. Everyone loves the CEO, but the trade's just very simply not working. Now, I think you're at a major crossroads here with this name, and what I'm seeing on the weekly are some things here that, quite frankly to me, are a little scary, where you're trying to rally and you're failing, and you, every control bar is just literally staying in control. What always bothers me is when I have charts like this, where I go up, over, reverse, and it's the low. It's really rare to not have another down day, really rare. And I wanna be very specific about this. So if you go and look at this chart, when you have these down bars like this, where you've encapsulated something else, not just a down bar, but where you're encapsulating something else, it is very rare, like you did here, that you're not going to have a follow through. And it doesn't have to be the be all end all follow through, but it's really very rare to not have one. So 130 is certainly possible. And does that mean that all these trades are dead. And I don't think it does. If you look at NVIDIA, NVIDIA got added to the Dow on Friday at the close, and it was around 140 after hours. Let's go take a look at that right now so you're getting the right data. Um, to me, there's, look, I was to say something. There's only 30 names in the Dow. Being added to it, to me, is like being thrown, you know, given steroids when you're working out. Like, you, it's just such an edge because everybody that wants to buy the Dow, every index that wants to own it. Every older guy that's got like an IRA or girl that's got an IRA, they own the Dow. So this is going to stabilize the heck out of this name. Now, Friday and Monday are going to be wild because of this, but you will see people buy this. The other one to watch, just so you guys are aware, is just watch Sherwin-Williams. It's much, much thinner in the way it traded after hours, but this move with NVIDIA 
going into this is absolutely huge. And I would expect you to see some follow through. It's certainly going to be a wild trading day on Monday and you're going to want to be aware of this. It's very rare to be taking something out of the Dow and putting something in it. And it says a lot about what people think of NVIDIA. It's much harder, in my opinion, to get into the Dow than it is to get into the S&P. Remember, you still have earnings this week on top of everything else. And the mother of them all is coming out Wednesday, November 20th, which is NVIDIA. And earnings have been crazy this quarter. There is a reason for this, but I want to just point this out. So since 2009, what we're seeing here is you had all-time highs, and it's been getting higher and higher. So 12% of all stocks in the S&P moved more than 10% on earnings, more than any time in the past 15 years. I'm just going to tell you why. If you read research reports this day, nobody's putting themselves on the line. What they're doing is they're giving you this kind of milk toast report, and they're saying, oh, well, our bear case is this, our neutral case is this, and our bull case is this. Very few people are actually saying what they think. And this is really where those kinds of people, when they're saying it and they're accurate, like that gentleman that came out on Apple and was right, that's why these stocks are so volatile on earnings. And that's why I've been more active after hours and pre-market on earnings and the day of earnings, because this is where the money is. And you always want to go to where the money is. Now, as promised, one of the things that people have brought up with these videos when I talk about fundamental analysis is their ability to get this information. So when I have something that I think is pertinent, I'm just going to share it with the group. Amazon big operating beat and guided operating profit above street. AWS was stable in line at 19%. The street was looking for 21.22. 19 was huge. What's so fascinating is that's 110 billion on an annualized run rate. Okay, in much better margins. They guided CapEx 75 billion. That's 10% above the street. So I want to be really clear about this. CapEx is what are you spending? What are they spending their money on right now? Data centers, and then data centers, and then more AI chips, and then more data centers, okay? This is where it's going. Uranium, natural gas, data centers, AI chips, NVIDIA, and there's a number that you need to start watching to find out who's going to win. Okay? It, and it does, it's like an arms race. Whoever can spend the most is going to win, right? And this is what you're saying. This number is significantly higher than a couple companies that are other hyperscalers. Please keep that in mind. Expect to spend more than that in 25. Majority is for AWS and Generation AI. Note, Goldman Sachs research was at 68 for 24 and 78 for 25. So what does this mean? mean to you? Okay, so when we look at these hyperscaler numbers and what they're going to buy, Amazon is now saying that their fiscal year CapEx for 24 is what they thought they were going to spend on 25, which means 25 is going to be even higher. And that was 10% ahead of the street for 25. So Goldman not only was out there at 78 for 25, they were still at 7 billion over everybody else. And this is what they're spending. Do you think that this is a fad? So AI capex from hyperscaler remains healthy and is going up in 25. Amazon talking it up. Microsoft continues quarter over quarter and talking it up. We're gonna talk about Microsoft and the dumpster fire that it is in a second here. Meta seems to be suggested it hits the high end of its 40 to 60. Okay, who's spending more money? Amazon. Who were the winners this week? Amazon and Google, no matter what the stocks did, and we'll show you in a second why that's the case. Meta seems to suggest it hits the high end. However, it looks more like Taiwan Semi will be the one making chips. Samsung is a dumpster fire. Who's making all the chips? Taiwan Semi. Are they gonna buy more chips or less chips? They're going to buy more chips. How do you know that? Because they're increasing their CapEx. See how it's all connected? This is, right now you're watching a stool be constructive live on YouTube right now. Okay, This is why you start looking at the fundamentals and where the puck is going. You might have thought it was going somewhere else, but you go to where it is. I did not see Amazon coming out ahead of this. Right, I thought it would be candidly Microsoft, but we'll show you why it's not. Intel CapEx is unchanged, and that is the dumpster fire getting kicked out of the Dow as well, I believe. But what you want to see is this CapEx is like a flea on a gnat to what Amazon is spending. I wanted to show you how they're looking at this. And what's important for you to understand about when we do some fundamental analysis is I don't care what Freddie Fingers on Twitter says. I care what the guy that's writing the check says because he's the one that's got skin in the game. If you don't have skin in the games, you just have you just have a keyboard. Okay, you need skin in the game and you need to listen to the people that have skin in the game. So that's why buy side, meaning hedge funds when they speak is supposed to be so much more important than when sell side because sell side selling their research and buy side is actually putting money to work. All right, so this is really important and it's worth sharing. 10% ahead of the street, we went over that. But this line in opening remarks, 
Jazzy says that AI business is a multi-billion dollar business and that it's growing triple digit percentages year over year. And it's growing three times faster at its stage in evolution than AWS did itself. So their new business is growing three times faster than AWS did, which is their growth engine. I just want you to wrap your noodle around that. Now, it's just not Amazon, and we're gonna look at who the winners are, but when we break out Google and what's happening there, there's a couple lines in here that I thought were super important. And what we're gonna just focus on is one of them. Google Cloud Operating Income. Estimate was 1.1 billion. They came in at 1.95 billion. Now, services and these numbers are staggering. They are staggering the way that they are grow growing and they are just very simply a cash. And you can see their CapEx, their operating margins are up. Everything's firing on all cylinders. But what we're seeing here is that this division, this cloud division, is double in income the estimate. And this is one of the core things that you will find winners and losers. And right now, we're seeing the differentiation between who's going to win this war. So we can see here with AMD, and I just think it's important just for, for our purposes, not so much AMD, but all the growth is coming from blue. It's all coming from data centers, and there's no reason that that's going to stop. But it's important to see who's winning and who's losing the data center battle. Now, this is a really great graph, and what it's gonna show us very clearly is growth rates of the cloud business between Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. And you're going to note a couple things here. First and foremost, what sticks out to me is that Google is kicking everybody's butt on a percentage basis. But what we are seeing here is we are seeing AWS start to creep up. And what we are seeing is we're seeing Microsoft cloud revenue getting worse and worse and worse. Now we're saying, oh, well, we upticked a little bit. Did we? Right. So what we're seeing here from Q3 on is that Microsoft has been dropping since Q3. And so if we go to third quarter, 23, which is one, two, three, four, five quarters now out, and just take a look at the names for a second and see how they're doing. But I think it's very important to say that, yep, Google has surpassed Microsoft in growth for some time. And what we're starting to see is we can see the drop and then we can see the demand starting to pick up again for cloud growth rates. Now, most people will say, well, who cares? What's so important about this? Well, here's Amazon that's up 38% since that date. If we take this as a zero line, Google is up 25% and Microsoft is up nine. What's starting to happen here is we're starting to have clearly defined winners of the data center space and we're starting to get clearly defined losers in the data space. And I think this is very important to pay attention to. So what you wanna do is we wanna focus on who's winning, okay, and focus on those names. Now for me, there's a couple things here. One, I don't have an interest in the cloud space of Microsoft until they turn it around. Two, Google has some issues here with what they're gonna deal with antitrust. And I don't think that there's a company that has more at risk besides this and Meta than who's gonna be the FTC chair, but we'll see how that plays out. But really what's important is to understand that people are concerned because Bezos is selling 3 billion of stock. Why do I not care? Because it takes 2 billion a year just to run Blue Origin, let alone the paper that bleeds out. Washington Post bleeds out 100 million. I think it's a month or a quarter. Somebody's gotta pay for it. So when you think about it from that perspective, it does make sense why he would sell two to three percent of his holdings. Now, for me, I would be focused on Amazon and watching how this plays out and do we break above that key level. Now, a couple things here, a couple notes that we should definitely go over so that you're prepped for next week. Number one, SMCI is going to give, quote, a business update uh, on this day. Now, the language seems to me a little different. Some people are, are splitting hair saying it's not different. That's okay. What's important about this is it's a 10Q and I know that people are like, well, 10Qs aren't audited anyway, it's the year end that are audited. They still need a set of eyes to review what they're going to say on the 10Q. It is extremely rare to not have an auditor and to be a publicly traded company. The amount of liability is beyond staggering. So I'm very curious how this plays out, what happens on Tuesday. At the time of recording this, I have a and have had a short position and a lot of puts on this. Uh, very clear why I feel that way about it. What we are seeing is we're seeing people suggest that it's great for Dell, they're, they're the only game in town. Maybe, maybe it is good for Dell. Maybe it's also good for AVGL. I don't know, right? but we're gonna see how this plays out. My concern here has been the fallout on what's gonna happen with SMCI, and I speak of this as someone that has a huge position in NVIDIA, but did clear a lot of my calls out, actually all my calls out, because I'm concerned about any kind of follow through here. And, and one thing that could hurt us 
is something like that. I am surprised that NVIDIA got added to the Dow now, and that is a sign of confidence. They check that kind of stuff as much as they can. Uh, so there is a little bit of confidence there that maybe that you don't see some collateral damage. But, you know, SMCI is a big client. It's a big client of NVIDIA. And so I don't see how you don't see something out there that's going to hurt it. But we'll see how this plays out. But this is definitely one to watch next week. And again, in transparency, I really don't have a long or short here, but I just want to show something that I think is very important. And I know people don't have access to this, so I just want to just put it out there. You got, I got a sell signal uh, on DeMarc for MicroStrategies, and you can see it right here. You, you, are they BL ends all? Does that mean I have to get out? No. But when you see a blow off like this after an extreme move to the upside, you might just want to just slow your roll a little bit there because a drop back down to a core level to test is really not the end of the world. And you could see something like that. You could absolutely see a level where you get to like 201, 204. There's a couple levels in here. People say, oh, it can't happen. It can happen in 15 minutes. So believe me, everything you think can't happen is the same thing that happened to somebody when they broke up here and someone said, oh, you could come back to 124. It can happen. Does that mean it does? No. You have an election, you have FOMC next week, and you have a lot of people that are like a cat in a hot tin roof that are just locking it in. What I always worry about is the following. When I see things that don't make sense, like we're selling gold, we're selling Bitcoin, so we're selling the inflation trade, but at the same time, we're selling bonds. When I start to see correlation like that, the inability of the cues to get over that 500 level, which is that CPI month over month, you have to connect the dots and put the brakes on. You have to put the brakes on. You have to say to yourself, is this an optimal time for me to be looking at what's going on? Or did we just break a huge trend line here? And do I just want to slow my roll and see what happens with the election and see what happens with the FOMC? Or do I want to be out there sky jumping without a parachute? That's up to you. But when your advanced decline line looks like this and we're hitting highs, but we're at that key level that we talked about with the bands, you just might want to pump the brakes and let this stuff sort its way out.